Okay. So welcome back, everyone. Hope you had a pleasant uh, Easter break. So the plan for today is to go through uh, hopefully most of the part of these lectures that I just named aspects of Bayesian statistics, uh, which will be uh, us writing Bayes' theorem in many, many ways in different, uh, different ways. And talking about uh, the interpretations of that and how to use it for uh, model comparison and how to use it for parameter estimation. And once we're done with those sort of basics and the discussions around that, uh, the plan is to move on to this specific algorithm called nested sampling, which is uh, one uh, fairly common uh, algorithm for actually useful both for uh, model comparison and parameter estimation. So that's roughly the plan. So let's quickly recap where we left off uh, before Easter. So uh, we were looking at these uh, two main interpretations of probability. Uh, one was the frequentist one, which said that the probability of X is defined to be equal to this infinite uh, limit, and then the relative ratio of the, so you take the number of occurrences in some infinite limits, um, but then we also discussed how that then ties you only to discuss repeatable things. Um, the other alternative was the Bayesian interpretation, which said that the probability of X is defined uh, equal to your degree of belief or knowledge that X is true. And this is quite a uh, this is quite a general definition, which means that you can apply it to a lot of general uh, problems. And we saw that within this Bayesian framework, you had this division between what we call subjective Bayesian probability and objective Bayesian probability. And then the other thing we did last time was that we did a basic refresher on uh, probability theory and especially on the properties of many dimensional probability distributions, uh, because that will be sort of the probability theory is the bread and butter of patient statistics. So then today we do aspects of patient. Statistics. I mean, of course, there are courses, dedicated courses in patient statistics. So this will be uh, a highly um, subjective summary from my point of view, based on uh, essentially based on my practical experience with it and the sort of pitfalls and things to be aware of um, that I found in my own work uh, to be important to be aware of. Our starting point is, of course, base theorem. And in the common, completely general form, you know this as the probability of A given B is the probability of B given A times the probability of A divided by the probability of B. And as we discussed last time, I mean, this is just a rule from probability theory. Uh, of course, for quantization patients are both equally happy with this mathematical relation. But what makes this specifically useful for patients is that we can now um, introduce some new notation. So let's, so we'll let H, you know, some 
hypothesis. <coughs> we'll let D denote some data. And we'll let I just denote, say, any other information. And then patients can discuss because of their view of probability, they can discuss things like P of H and P of H given D, etc. So that means that we can then write um, this theorem in another way. Just the base theorem as the probability of some hypothesis. And this is now given some data. And I'll also condition this on any other background information. Uh, I'll typically skip this I eventually, but I think it's important to put it in there in the beginning, just to remind ourselves that actually there's always some background information. And uh, whether we write it or not, we always have some sort of background information. So we then get that this should be equal to the probability of the data when we assume that the hypothesis is true and we're still conditioning on background information times the probability of the hypothesis being true when we only condition on the background information and then divided on just the general probability of the data given this background information. So this particular form of base theorem is then unique to patients. Um, and so we have these, um, these different components and let's see how I want to do this. We'll do this in more detail shortly, but this uh, term is what we called the posterior or H. This one is the prior or H. So posterior and prior are referred to before and after looking at data. And this is just the okay, probability of data as, let's say, as predicted by your hypothesis. If you assume that your hypothesis is true, uh, how much probability does your hypothesis assign to the data? And um, this part uh, is called the, uh, goes under various names, uh, marginal, Likelihood, I will typically refer to it as the patient evidence. And we'll uh, discuss this quite extensively when we get to model comparison. Um, This patient evidence is nothing but, it's essentially just the law of total probability. So that if you have a set of multiple mutually exclusive hypotheses, so say all your possible hypotheses are H1, H2, and H3, and those are all the possible hypotheses, right? Then this would just be, uh, as you'd expect, P of E given H1 and I. Probability of H1 given I plus P given H2 I P of H2 I and etc. For complete set of mutually. Uh, exclusive hypothesis. 
HR. So this is effectively just the, the law of the world. So what we'll do now is that we will. Uh, Sorry, really quick. So you just basically inserted a partition of unity there, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, I mean, it's it's in a sense the definition yeah. of that set of hypotheses being complete. Yes. One of them has to give rise to to the data. Um, what we'll do now is that we will go through these various uh, factors in a bit more detail, and we'll use this to introduce uh, first model comparison and then um, parameter estimation. So we uh, typically distinguish to um, applications. Uh, namely, parameter estimation. Uh, and in that case, what we are typically after is some, say you have, you assume that your overall model is true. So you just have a single model or a single hypothesis, but this hypothesis comes with some free parameters and I'll just call them data. Uh, so in that case, you're after what's the posterior probability for the various possible values of this parameter or your several parameters data after you have taken into account the data and you have assumed that your model M is true. So what does this probability distribution look like? That's parameter estimation. Uh, model comparison. That's when you're talking about the probability of an entire model being true. Uh, these can still be uh, models with free parameters, but you're taking the sort of overall view and saying, okay, if I uh, consider this entire model with it, its entire parameter space, um, what's the probability of that model being true? And as we'll get back to, it turns out that you can't really one of the things that the Bayesian framework tells you is that assessing a single model on its own is kind of pointless because your entire, you, you have to work with a, a complete hypothesis space. And if your complete hypothesis space contains only one model, then you're gonna keep believing in that one model regardless of the data, right? No matter how, unlikely the data look from your model, if that's your only alternative, you're just gonna say, yeah, this model is true. Uh, because you have a total of 100% probability to distribute across all the models. And if you only have one model, you're gonna put all your belief in that. Model. So one of the things that the Bayesian um, framework now tells you is that you have to do model comparison. Uh, and then what you end up looking at is the posterior odds. So odds is just a ratio of probabilities. So you can, for instance, say, what's my posterior probability for model one relative to my posterior probability for some alternative model M2. And if you just now rewrite um, both the numerator and the denominator with base theorem, um, there's gonna be this, um, this marginal likelihood part is going to be equal for the two models because that's just going to be the, uh, the probability of the data. Uh, so that's going to cancel. And what you're left with is just the probability of data given model one times the prior probability of model one and divided by the probability of the data in model two and the prior of model two. And so in model comparison, you're looking at what is the value of this ratio. And that tells you, that will tell you uh, whether you should 
believe in model one versus model two. But it's important to keep in mind that, that this is a model comparison. So uh, whether you should believe in model one depends on what you compare it to. And this is fundamentally quite different from the philosophy of doing hypothesis testing with infrequentist statistics. Because the, the sort of equivalent in frequentist statistics would be that you're testing whether to exclude a hypothesis. So you set some threshold and you say, if the data I observe has a sufficiently low probability under my one model, I'm going to assume that this model is false. So in that case, you, you, you're sort of saying, I can, I can exclude this model if the data just is sufficiently unlikely without actually necessarily specifying an alternative model. Then in the Bayesian framework, you say, actually, that's not sensible. If you only have one model, uh, you will always believe in it. Uh, you have to define some specific alternative. So in order to form that ratio, do you have to integrate out potential model parameters of M1 and M2? Yes, indeed. And, okay. and this will be the main challenge of doing model comparison, mm -hmm. will be performing that interval. So you're really trying to sort of compare the, uh, the global structure of model yes. 1 and model 2. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a global view. Mm -hmm. And when, when we write it like this, it looks like these are fundamentally different things, the parameter estimation and the model comparison. But actually, in a sense, they're not. Because parameter estimation is basically just, uh, it's effectively a way of saying every point in my parameter space is a potential model that I'll compare to each other, or I'll compare to effectively the, the point of highest probability, right? Uh, so it's, it's just like a continuous model space. Uh, so they're actually not that different, um, but, but it's typically uh, something like this. Um, I'll just rewrite this theorem in terms of how we look at it in terms of parameter estimation, because that's sort of the, the typical notation you'll see and then we'll go into these different factors uh, of Bayes' theorem in a bit more detail. Um, so if we take uh, estimation as example, uh, then and now I will start leaving out that, that I, the general background information. Uh, so then we can write posterior or some parameter value theta given data and model written as okay the probability of data and given that some particular parameter value is true and the model is still true times the probability of that parameter value being true before looking at the data divided by the general probability of data the overall probability of data uh, I'm just assuming that the model is true. And the notation that I'm typically used for this is that this first factor uh, is, I'll denote as L theta. So that's the likelihood. The second factor is what's called the prior probability. And I'll denote that as pi theta. And then um, this uh, probability of the data in the model, given the model. Um, integrated over all parameter space. I'll just denote that as set. And keep in mind that that's now independent of the parameter, right? Because that's integrated over all parameter space. So in other words, we could write this as L theta, I theta, and then the integral of the likelihood times prior over all the parameter space. So this is typically the notation I'll use um, for these things. Um, we'll start by discussing uh, the likelihood function. Which is this? Oh, oh, that's 
So the way you get this is that you take, uh, so start from uh, the probability of data given a parameter value. Uh, I'll now start leaving out that model condition because that's just is given M is just um, in all the factors here. So you start from this uh, the probability that of the data given some parameter value. And if you read this as a function of the data, of possible data, it's a probability distribution. Uh, so as function of D, uh, this is a PDF. Um, but to get what I will call the likelihood function, then you say I have some observed data. Uh, and I'll insert that into my probability distribution. So if we insert for the data, we insert the particular values that we observed in our measurement or experiment or data collection or whatever. And read the resulting expression as a function of data. Right. Uh, now this is likelihood function, and this is not in any way a PDF. The likelihood function is not a PDF for theta. Right. It's just some mathematical function of theta. But it does not have the problem, the properties of a probability distribution because it is just some mathematical function of theta. Um, and the way you have to think about it uh, is to try to think of it as if I vary my model parameter, what is the probability that my model assigns to the data or that my model would assign to the data I actually observed? That's the likelihood, right? I have observed some data. Let's see if I try to tweak my model parameters, how my predicted probability to observe those data would vary across my model parameter space. Um, and this is why, in frequentist terms, right, when you do uh, parameter estimation, um, the typical uh, foundation of doing parameter estimation in frequency statistics is doing maximum likelihood methods, right? So that's just let's find the model parameters that assigns the highest possible probability to the data I observed within my model. That's the foundation of um, frequency parameter estimation. Um, but uh, in my lectures were patients, so we're going to insist on using probabilities, and the likelihood is not itself a probability. It's effectively a scaling factor that we apply to our prior probability to get our posterior probability. So let's uh, look at a particular example, uh, just because, so this is this confusion between what a likelihood function is and that it's not a probability distribution and that it doesn't satisfy the usual rules of PDFs, et cetera. That's probably one of the most common confusions that I encounter when people first start uh, using Bayesian methods. Um, and one of the most confusing terms you'll hear when also discussing papers is when people start talking about the likelihood distribution. That's, I think that's fundamentally a bad idea to talk about because that really makes it sound like it's a probability distribution. It should be a likelihood function. Um, what also might be confusing, I try to avoid it, but is that quite often you'll see this probability term here, even when it's even when you have fixed the parameter value and just read it as a PDF for possible data D, people will talk about that as the likelihood. It's the likelihood of the data. And 
And that's in a sense that that's fine because when you say likelihood, you, you say, okay, it's it's the part of base theorem that has that structure of D given uh, some theory assumption. Uh, personally, I try to avoid it. I just call it the probability of the data. And I only use the term likelihood when I'm actually reading this as a function of data. So, um, for instance, if we did um, uh, in particle physics, the PDF, apart from the, the normal distribution, the PDF you encounter most typically is the Poisson distribution. Uh, so, let's just uh, look at that as an example because it sort of highlights how different these things are. So, uh, for solve this version, which is um, the probability to say observe some number of counts in a counting experiment or something like that. So it's a probability distribution for some discrete variable m, and it's a one-parameter distribution uh, and a parameter I'll call lambda. And the form of this PDF is that it's lambda to the n power e uh, of minus lambda and then n factorial. So this is uh, as PDF for m. Uh, it's a discrete PDF. Or the discrete variable m, but as a likelihood for um, lambda, it's a continuous function because lambda is a continuous parameter. Function of continuous parameter. Um, so, this is one of the examples where using these things uh, really get into trouble. And so, the likelihood function or, or this, this probability of the data, this is effectively where you model your experiments. And this is where you say, if I have this model and I have this parameter value theta, what probability distribution does my model predict for the data? Uh, sometimes this will just be a Gaussian normal distribution, right? Where your model might predict, um, your model might predict the mean uh, some normal distribution of how you expect your data to, to be. And perhaps the width of that normal distribution is another parameter which describes the uncertainty in your measurements or the uncertainty in your detector or something like that. So in that case, the, the likelihood function could be as simple as, um, as a, a normal or based on a normal distribution. Uh, but in general, it can be super complicated. For instance, in, in particle physics, if your experiment is performing some giant counting experiment and binning your data in a histogram, right, then your likelihood function, you would say, okay, every bin in this his histogram is a independent counting experiment uh, because the data in one bin is going to be independent from the data in another bin one data point can't live in both bins. And each bin is going to be, I'm going to model each bin. My PDF for the data in each bin is going to be a, a Poisson distribution. Then my joint probability for all the data is going to be a product of a Poisson distribution for each individual bin with a lambda parameter for each individual bin, which is my Theories expectation for how many counts do I expect in bin one and bin two and bin three and bin four. So then it's going to be a giant product of also distributions. That's going to be this probability of the data given some theory parameter. And then when I insert all my observed counts, then I have a likelihood function. But that might then be a many-dimensional likelihood function. 
But this is the local function is effectively where you figure out, decide um, what probability distribution should I use to model my uh, data, uh, to model my experiments. And this is no different from fragmented statistics, right? Fragmented statistics is also based on the fact that you're going to assume that your data uh, is samples from some probability distribution. Uh, so that's the, the likelihood. Uh, probably, uh, I'd say the most uh, conceptually dangerous and tricky of these factors. Um, so let's now look at the prior. So while I would say the likelihood is, is in a sense, the most complicated, and the prior is definitely the most controversial uh, because this is what separates, uh, this is where all the frequencies uh, get uh, upset. Uh, so this is uh, the most controversial, and I'd say most useful. Statistics. Um, so the formalism require us to quantify our degree of belief, our prior assumptions uh, using probabilities. Uh, so it's our degree of belief for some hypothesis or some parameter value theta before looking at the data. Uh, and the big question then is so let's just say we. In data value for considering data. Um, note that the, the, the logic of, of Bayesian reasoning um, is sort of iterative. I mean, if you did an experiment uh, two days ago, and you then had your prior, and you did an experiment, you got some data, and then you derived a posterior. And now you're doing another experiment two days later. You can take that posterior from two days ago and insert it as your prior now. Right? That sort of sequential updating is perfectly fine. And it should give the same result as if you just combined all the data together and assumed it was a single experiment and just starting with the priors that you started with two days ago. That, that is mathematically equivalent. So that means what we call, when, when I say before considering data, you can think of it as before considering your new data. Uh, it might be, your prior might be informed by, by previous data. And uh, so this is where we get into uh, this whole discussion of subjective versus objective, and we won't rehash that discussion. But uh, some people think that the, the choice of price should be objective, and some don't. Um, the, I would say, in practice, the sort of key question here is, what's a reasonable choice for a prior? Or how do you, if you want to be conservative, if you want to express, um, if you want to make sort of as, as weak assumptions as possible before considering any data, what probability distribution will you use? Then? So, okay, if I, if I pose you that question, if, if you have some probability or, or you have a model with a single parameter theta, uh, you have not looked at any data yet. Um, any thoughts on what would be a reasonable PDF or a prior? Would be flat. A flat distribution, right? That, that makes perfect sense. And in many cases, I would agree that it's perfectly reasonable. What if I told but you... you need to fix like the minimum and maximum value, right? Right. So maybe because a completely flat distribution without endpoints, that's unnormalized. Yes, right? exactly. uh, so, so that would be uh, what's called an improper prior. Uh, but typically, when you define a model, you will be able to say, well, this parameter can't be smaller than this or larger than that. So you define some some reasonable range. Um, so in many cases, a flat distribution 
makes a lot of sense. Uh, but what if I told you that this parameter in your model is actually, it's a dimensionful parameter and it has dimensions of say an energy scale or a, I don't know, a frequency scale or a length scale or something like that. Um, is it, is it necessarily so that then a flat distribution still makes the most sense? Let's, let's say that you... I mean, uh, typically, that, like, if it's a dimensional problem, then you can define like a characteristic length scale, right? True, true. So if, you okay, yeah, exactly. Thing to that thing, and then you have... Uh, <laughs> so, so I agree. If, if, if you have, if you already know, based on your previous information, that actually the, the characteristic length scale, um, this experiment or this model or whatever I'm modeling is one meter. Yes. Sure. Okay. Then I'll take a, a flat distribution between zero and ten meters. Whatever. Perfectly fine. Um, but if you take a particle physics example, because I can't think of anything else but <laughs> example from my own field uh, on the fly. Um, take the the mass of a dark matter particle, right? And this is famously one of the least constrained unknown particle physics parameters in the world, right? We, we know there must be at least one, some type of new particle that's dark matter. But the mass of this new particle can vary across, like, I don't know, 20 orders of magnitude, right? What happens if you take a flat distribution that goes from, say, zero to one million, right? If you do that, say, okay, so, so say we're just, uh, we're working with say just uh, six orders of magnitude from one to one million. If you take a flat distribution between zero and one million, 90% uh, of your probability is gonna live between 100,000 and one million, right? 99% of your probability is gonna live between 10,000 and one million. So you have just now assigned a tiny, 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 tiny probability to the first few orders of magnitude. And you've effectively said that actually, I thought I was being conservative and, and being completely uninformative, but actually I, I made the assumption that the length scale or this mass scale is towards its, its higher possible order of magnitude. And in that case, um, um, probably more reasonable way of expressing your uh, complete lack of information of a scale is to use a flat distribution in the logarithm of your variable. So I might assign a, a flat probability distribution to the log of this scale. Um, so the point here is just that, but, but then that flat probability distribution, then if you transform that back to a probability distribution in your original parameter, it's not going to look flat at all, right? So uh, to take that one particular example, uh, what's typically called a log prior, is that the prior probability of the logarithm of some parameter, and so it's the logarithm of that parameter, if that prior probability is flat, well, then if you do the variable transform, What's the probability, the corresponding probability distribution for the parameter itself? That's going to be sort of one over x. So um, this is just to, to point out that actually in choosing your, your prior probability distributions, you, you really have to think carefully about what is it that I'm, I want to express uncertainty about. Because as you change your uh, parameterization, your PDFs are going to change. Uh, a typical sort of rule of thumb is that if the parameter you have is a type of what's called a location parameter, then a flat distribution makes a lot of sense. And the, the classic example of a location parameter is the mean of a normal distribution. You can shift the normal distribution back and forth. Okay, I don't know where the mean is. I'm going to assign a flat probability distribution to that. But the width of a probability distribution or a normal distribution is a classic example of a scale parameter. 
and uh, perhaps I'll have to assign a, a log prior to the width. Something like that. This is um, one of the tricky things. To, to, you really have to worry about it. Um, so we've done the bucket and we've done the prior. Um, that leaves us with the um, evidence or the marginal likelihood. And this is what will bring us into um, model comparison. Um, a bit more in detail. <coughs> so in the statistics literature, uh, this is typically called marginal likelihood. In the physics-based literature that I've been reading, it's typically called Asian evidence. And I'll use the notation uh, set. So, as we discussed to begin with, okay, this is the probability of just the data, like globally in your model. Um, but that means that you have actually integrated out the parameters of the model. So, let's just take a one parameter model uh, for now. So this means that this is the joint, you can write this as the joint probability of the data and uh, some parameter value in your model and integrating out that parameter value. Uh, so this is just a classic way of getting rid of a parameter uh, in probability theory. And this we can rephrase as the probability of the data given the parameter value and the model times the probability of that parameter value given the model. And this we now recognize as just the integral of the likelihood times the prior over your uh, model parameter space. Uh, so it's sort of, it's the one way of viewing it is, is that it's the, the sort of the likelihood function averaged over your model parameter space when you have, you do the averaging by weighting each parameter point with your prior probability assigned to that parameter point. Um, so in that sense, it's sort of the, the average effectively goodness of fits on of your um, model across the, the parameter space. And I've written this now as a one-dimensional integral, but typically you'll have a many-dimensional theory. So you will be working with some set of parameters of data instead of just a single theta. And that means that computing this integral is a high dimensional integral and it's going to be tricky and very difficult to do. Um, uh, there are many, I mean, there are several reasons the high dimensional integrals are tricky um, by default, but also your likelihood function might have a complicated structure. It might have very localized peaks in some regions. But it might also, if you have a, if you have a very large dimensional parameter space, there might be huge regions of that parameter space that gives a sort of okay-ish fit to the data. It gives a sort of, yeah, the model across huge parameter space, your model assigns not zero probability to the data, but some small-ish probability for the data. So that means your likelihood function can be small, but across a huge parameter space. And that will also contribute hugely to this integral because it occupies a huge part of the space you're integrating over. Right? So um, computing this integral is tricky because you sort of have to catch both the peaks, but also the sort of possible huge flat regions of your integral. But do we really have to worry about this integral? Since I mean, it's the result is independent of the the model parameter, right? And if you're just interested in the interest in the posterior distribution, which is a function of the model parameter in the end. Exactly. So uh, so effectively you just uh, you just express my next bullet point uh, perfectly. I mean uh, and we'll, we'll stop here and take a, a short break, but but the next bullet point will be the fact that for parameter estimation, you don't care about this. For model comparison, this is the key quantity that you have to compute. 
but uh, let's stop there and take uh, 15 minutes. So, um, we're discussing the marginal likelihood or Bayesian evidence, and as we said just before break, um, and that this um, quantity is not for um, parameter estimation. Um, is in the face uh, role of a normalization constant, right? Because uh, the posterior of your parameter given the it's just L data I data over this constant set. So you can just say it's proportional to L theta, I theta. Um, and this is effectively how, for parameter estimation, you can use um, Markov chain Monte Carlo methods for sampling um, for approximating this posterior density because. Um, then you end up drawing samples, drawing theta samples proportional to L theta times I theta, uh, but without actually computing this uh, interval necessarily. Um, and that works because you can just, when you have all your samples, you can just say, oh, well, I know that's the, the interval of a probability distribution is one anyway, so just normalize it if I have to. Uh, doesn't matter. So for parameter estimation, it doesn't matter. But that is key quantity or whole comparison. So I'll just use this now to transition into a um, a discussion of uh, whole comparison. So. Then what we're looking at is this posterior. So say we have two models, M1 and M2. And we want to compare them. So uh, in light of some data P, right? So we want to compare what's their posterior ratio. In other words, this ratio. And as we've seen, this then becomes P of D in model one times the prior, your prior probability for the entire model one, divided by the probability of the data in model two and the prior in model two. And this is simply the ratio of these patient evidences, set one and set two within each model, and then the ratio of your prior probability for I'm just changing um, notation uh, from P to this pi and two. So this is what we'll call the posterior odds. And this factor, which is the key factor, is what's called base factor or alternatively the evidence ratio. And then this is your prior odds. And this prior odds is, unless you have good reasons not to, it typically set it to one. Because that's just saying, actually, I will, I have 100% prior probability to assign, I'm gonna assign 50% to model one and 50% to model two. So then this is just a ratio of one half over one half, which is one. So unless you have, I mean, if you have a reason to prefer one model over the other, you definitely should uh, encode that. And, but, but very often in model comparisons, you'll see that people just set that prior uh, odds ratio to one 
And in that case, your posterior odds just becomes this uh, base factor, the ratio of these evidences. So, uh, what does that mean, and how do we interpret this base factor? Um, so, um, base factor, uh, and I'll just say and for the exterior odds. Because again, if you just set your prior odds to one, then your interpretation of the base factor is going to be as well your interpretation of the posterior odds ratio because they're equal. And um, so I'll use a notation B12 to just be this base factor, set one over set two. And so you should think of this as um, I'm comparing model one to model two. And I'm essentially asking um, how strong is the evidence in the data for preferring model one over model two. So, um, and then there is a convention for interpreting this, just like in um, classical statistics or frequentist statistics, uh, you have a convention of using p values of 5%. I right? say I'm, I will exclude this hypothesis if uh, under that hypothesis, the probability of getting this data or less likely data, or more extreme data, is 5% uh, or smaller than I will. And that, that number, right, 5% is pure convention. Uh, it's just, it's useful to, to do, agree on, on some thresholds like that. And similarly, there are conventions for how to interpret this base factor. And uh, so it's common to use um, to use uh, what's called I don't know how you want to put that in quotes. Uh, it's called Jeffrey's scale. Uh, this scale, uh, I mean, I'm using this now as a generic term, but there's actually a few versions of this scale. Uh, there's uh, another scale which serves the exact same purpose, just with some different numbers, um, which uh, is by um, Cass and Rafferty. But I'll just refer to everything as Jeffrey scale. And what it is is just a, a set of threshold values for this uh, base factor, and then translated to uh, expressions in words about how strong or how weak do we think this evidence is. Uh, so you're typically looking at the absolute value of the logarithm of this base factor. So that's going to be one column. I'll put down the actual odds ratio, in other words, the base factor itself. Then I'll have a column called the strength of Evans for M1 versus M2. And I'll have one column here, which is the actual posterior probability P of M1 given D, if uh, we'll set the prior probability ratio to one. In other words, if P of M, the prior P of M equal the prior P of M two equals one half. Um, and then um, the version of the scale that I've been using at least says that, okay, first of all, if this logarithm is, uh, less than one, that means that the odds ratio is less than around three to one, then that's typically regarded as, okay, it's inconclusive. You have no strong reason to prefer. The data does not give you a strong reason to prefer model one over model two. And in terms of the posterior, actual posterior probability for M1, is, is that okay? Your posterior probability is less than seventy-five percent. That's okay. Um, that's uh, inconclusive. 
uh, up to uh, a value of uh, 1.0. So that's up to an odds ratio of 3 to 1. Typically call this weak evidence um, for M1. And um, no, not up to one, but uh, one or larger. Um, and this is um, that threshold value would correspond to a probability, a positive probability of 75%. The next step is this logarithm being equal to 2.5 which is approximately an odds ratio of 12 to 1. And this is typically referred to as moderate evidence. And then your posterior probability is around 92%. And then the next threshold is 5.0, which is an odds ratio of around 150 to 1. And that's when you say you actually, this data, constitutes strong evidence for model one um, compared to model two. And then you're at a level of 99.3% posterior probability for the model. Uh, so again, these are conventions, but it gives you a language effectively. It, it makes sure that we can all agree on a language uh, so that if you do a Bayesian model comparison in a paper, you would then, okay, you compute this base ratio, and then you typically use this sort of language, right? You say, well, blah, 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 according to Jeffrey scale, this data constitutes moderate evidence for that model, right? Uh, so it, it sort of gives us a, a common language to, to discuss these things. Um, it might look like by, if you just look at this expression here, right? So you have this evidence ratio, uh, set one over set two, and then you set your prior odds ratio to one. And we just said that, well, this evidence ratio is, so the Bayesian evidence is independent of your parameter value, right? Because you integrated it out. So it might look like we've now sort of escaped the whole problem of prior dependence of, okay, having your, or either a problem or a feature, it's a bug or a feature, depending on your type of view of statistics, but the fact uh, we've sort of, it looks like we've escaped this fact that your results can depend on, for instance, did I choose a flat prior or log prior for my parameters, right? But we haven't because that dependence is hiding within that value of set one and set two, right? What values you will get for set one and set two depends on what functional forms and ranges you choose for your parameter priors within that model. Uh, so uh, keep in mind uh, that B12 depends on of uh, the parameter priors uh, since v one two is nothing but set one over set two, which is again nothing but v okay. The likelihood in model one for the same model one has a parameter theta one, and then the two. And the prior in model one for this voucher, theta one, much greater than similarly in model two. So your, um, what you choose for these pi's of theta will affect these, the values that you get for this inputs. And, even though in principle, this framework lets you compare effectively any model against any other model, right? They, uh, you, you might have a model M1, which, is, uh, which has uh, two parameters, let's call them A1 and A2, which represents, I don't know. Uh, okay, there you have two parameters, A1 and A2. And then you have another model M2, which has, um, four parameters, B1 to B4, 
And these parameters B1 to B4 does not represent anything like A1 and A2, right? That your the entire model is just different. It's parameterized in a completely different way. Um, but it can still give predictions for the same sort of data. In principle, right, this, there is nothing stopping you from using this framework to then compare these two models. But what you will find typically is that this depends on your parameter priors and quite easily dominate your results completely. Um, because it's, it's sort of, it's, it's conceptually, it can be conceptually quite difficult to think about how can I fairly compare two models which parameterize my problem in completely different ways uh, with sort of where, where the, the degrees of freedom have nothing to do with, it, with each other. Um, so the sort of a classic application of um, Bayesian model comparison where this I mean, it, it's not conceptually wrong. It's just that you, you will find that your choice of parameterization and your choice of prior functions can dominate your outcome quite significantly. Uh, and this effect becomes less severe if the sort of the, the more closely linked your models are. So the classic application of a Bayesian model comparison is, is comparing what's called nested models Right, where say you have one generic model and then you have an alternative model, which is a subset of that more generic model. Because then the parameters in these two models sort of have the same meaning and your choice of prior functions have effectively the same meaning in the two models. So these things, uh, these, uh, these prior dependence effects more cancel, uh, cancel out to a larger extent. So, um, say, um, prior dependence is, uh, uh, not, uh, let's say too much of a challenge in nested models. Uh, so one example could be that you have your more generic model is model two, and it has two parameters. Let's call them theta A, theta B. Both are free parameters. And then model one is the subset of this model where you say, OK, I have one free parameter, theta A, but actually I fix theta B to zero. But so that means that your more generic model has a two-dimensional parameter space, and your more constrained model lives along one line in that parameter space. Um, and then you can start comparing these two models. And then effectively, your choice of theta A has the same meaning in both uh, models, and you can assign the same type of prior function to theta A in both models, etc. Um, so. Uh, an example classic application of Bayesian model comparison would be, so you have some histogram of, of data, which it's, it's noisy data, it's a counting experiment, but you expect, say, if you do nuclear physics, you expect your data to be a result of many different resonances, some nuclear resonances. And so you expect that actually the underlying true distribution is some number of peaks. Right. Um, but because your data is noisy and some peaks might overlap, it's not clear whether this spectrum is best described by a model with uh, five peaks or six peaks or seven peaks. Right. Um, and then you can do Bayesian model comparison to sort of figure out okay, let me compare a five peak model to a six peak model and a six peak model to a seven peak model or a five peak model to a seven peak model and choose which one my Bayesian uh, framework says I should prefer. And what you get then by using this framework, I mean, you get a, you're, you're starting from a, from a consistent way of viewing probability as degree of belief. So 
and it's mathematically consistent. So you get a mathematically consistent way of talking about this as the view of belief. But I want to highlight um, three, let's say, different effects of this. Um, actually, let's only do two because the first one uh, I wanted to highlight was what we already discussed that. This framework tells you that it doesn't make sense to only consider a single uh, theory, a single model. You have to do model uh, comparison. So what I, uh, the headline I wanted to do now is just to use model comparison to to say, um, based on uh, or based theorem as two or. Uh, Consistent. So, okay, I'll write it down. Um, first of all, uh, it reminds us um, that we need uh, alternative hypothesis to judge, um, say, possibility of a hypothesis um, because if we add only uh, one hypothesis, let's call it H, we would say that the posterior probability of um, H is just P of B given H and my prior or H divided by the probability of D. But since I only have a single hypothesis, this probability of D is simply P of D given H times P of H is one. So this is just what we discussed before. Um, but I, uh, no matter the data, we'll have 100% degree of belief in a single model. Um, but what base theorem then also gives you, yeah, I mean, and, and it's, it's quite useful to think of this when it comes to model comparison, is that it automatically incorporates uh, this uh, saying that, okay, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So extra ordinary claims require strong ordinary evidence. Um, and the way to see this is okay, if I were to do Bayesian model comparison between two claims, uh, one claim is my extraordinary claim is the hypothesis H, and the alternative claim is that H is not true. It's my alternative claim is not H. Right. So okay, I would do I would do a Bayesian model comparison. I would say, what's the posterior ratio for P of H um, given the data compared to the alternative hypothesis, which is not H given the data. And now we know that this will be the base factor times the prior uh, odds ratio. This and this is an example where you definitely would not put the prior ratio to one, right? Because by saying that if you actually think that H is an extraordinary claim, what you're saying in Bayesian terms is that my prior degree of belief in this is tiny, right? So um, if uh, P of H is tiny, which is H is extra ordinary plane. Then the evidence, which is literally uh, P of D of H, has to be huge to prefer 
H over not H. So this sort of classic uh, saying that you hear uh, is is all there in this theorem. The that one is, is sort of trivial. Uh, one that I find more interesting, um, and the last one I wanted to highlight is Occam's Racer. So Occam's Racer is another one of those rules, quote unquote, for uh, reasoning that you, you hear all the time, um, which is effectively, I mean, it dates back to, to William of Ockham, um, a monk uh, and English philosopher back in the 1200s. Um, and he effectively has the sort of rule for reasoning that, okay, you shouldn't assume more than you have to. You shouldn't make more assumptions than you have to to explain whatever uh, you need to explain. So limit the number of assumptions. And this also lives inside base theorem. Um, so I would actually say that base theorem is an example for why it's sensible to think about Thomas Racer. Um, Um, so, in the way this manifests in, in vision model comparison is that um, in a model comparison, uh, say, models with um, fewer free parameters, uh, and more restrictive priors. Um, will be preferred um, unless data strongly favors, uh, um, strongly, let's say, prefers or requires. Um, a more complex model. And um, we can illustrate this quite easily uh, if we say, okay, let's, let's just do two one dimensional models, so one parameter models. And so they both have the same parameter theta. And the only difference between these two models is that within one model, the theta, this theta parameter is very unconstrained. And in another model, um, you have a more restricted prior. So it's, it's, it's a more constrained prior. So let's say that my prior in one model is this flat distribution. So let's say this was pi of theta in model two. And then in model one, say I have a more constrained prior. And it has to be higher than right because it has to be normalized one. And that's the key. Because now if both of these models are able to explain the data that this parameter has the same meaning in both models, we can put the likelihood function as a function of theta in the same plot and uh, would effectively be using two different y-axis. So that's um, the illustration so said that the likelihood function was some peak here, right? This is my likelihood function in both models. And then since we know that set is okay, it's the integral of the likelihood times the prior across the parameter space, you see that just because model one has squeezed its, its assumptions more closer together, the product of likelihood times prior will be a larger value than in model two. So by, because by restricting your assumptions, you also, and the normalization makes sure that you increase your prior probability across the parameter space you still leave open. Uh, and that is what gives you this open space effect. And it would be the same effect uh, if instead of just restricting the, the prior range, say one model had two free parameters and one model had only one free parameter, right? 
because then the, the height of the prior probability in, in the two parameter model would be uh, typically much smaller because you're taking 100% probability and smearing across a larger volume. Uh, so here you would get the set one to be larger than set two, which is this Occam source. Um, so this is what I wanted to say about uh, base model comparison. So we will get back to it when we actually get to nested sampling, uh, because so I've, I've discussed nested sampling as a way of, uh, or I've, I've talked about it um, so far as a way of sampling from your posterior distribution. And this is how I typically use it. Um, so I use it mainly for parameter estimation, which is the next thing we'll discuss. But Actually, the reason why nested sampling was invented was to compute the spatial evidence, this high dimensional interval, because you couldn't easily do that with Marco Chain Monte Carlo, so you needed another method. And um, so nested sampling, its main purpose is compute, computing these sets. And then as just a useful byproduct, useful byproduct, you get um, posterior samples that you can use for parameter estimation. Uh, so we will revisit uh, mode comparison. Any questions on mode comparison before we move to uh, prime transformation? So judging from the time, I'll get started on uh, prime transformation, and then next time we'll finish prime transformation and method sampling, and then move into uh, Russian processes. But uh, so. Any questions on all comparison? Okay. Uh, then the next thing we'll do is patient parameter estimation. So here I'll assume that we have uh, assume a model M is true, and I'll let that model have uh, some high dimensional parameter space, eta bar. It's just some vector of parameters. Um, so our goal is, well, theoretically, we want to obtain uh, the actual posterior, which is now a high dimensional probability distribution, P of theta, given the data, uh, likely function times prior divided by set. Uh, so that's theoretically what we want. Uh, in practice, uh, we want to try to get that um, probability distribution directly. Um, we want to try to sort of be able to evaluate that uh, directly as a function of theta. Um, we will try to obtain a set of samples from this posterior distribution. So we'll try to obtain a set of data samples um, from the posterior and use this uh, to um, have a estimate. Properties of the posterior distribution. Uh, so, this is our goal. In the end, uh, say we're doing this for a paper or a project, and 
how do we present our results? Um, so, what to present? Uh, and have, here we have uh, a number of different um, options. Um, we can't easily present a high dimensional probability distribution. Right? That's just a, a classic problem of visualizing uh, high dimensional uh, functions. So typically, uh, one thing we present is a collection of 1D or 2D uh, marginalized. And so, in other words, uh, okay, say I have a four dimensional model and I want to do the joint posterior of theta two and theta four. Okay, I'm just integrating out theta one and theta three. And if what I have is a collection of samples, uh, of data samples, which means, okay, every point I have has a theta one value, theta two, theta three, and theta four value, this just means, okay, make a histogram in terms of theta two and theta four, and just ignore theta one and theta three. If you make that histogram, that histogram will be an approximation of this probability distribution, uh, where you have marginalized or some of the overall the, your theta one and theta three samples, right? Um, and I'll show an example of this one particular way in which you often present a high dimensional posterior distribution, and it's like this. So here I've just taken a, um, a paper by some colleagues of mine, and don't care about the, the fact that there's uh, blue distributions and red distributions, just look at one of them. Um, so what this is, is that you have a three-dimensional posterior distribution of uh, three parameters uh, called, um, it's actually four parameters. Uh, it's this uh, sum over n u, which is sum between the masses. There's a parameter called n f, there's a parameter called delta n u r, and there's a parameter called r u. So you have a four-dimensional posterior distribution. You can't visualize a four-dimensional posterior distribution, but you can visualize all the pairs of two-dimensional posterior distributions, and you can visualize the four one-dimensional posterior distributions. So this is typically referred to as a triangle plot, and it's effectively, uh, it's almost a standard way of trying to visualize a uh, many-dimensional posterior distribution. Um, but, but you shouldn't be fooled by, or you should keep in mind that a lot of structure can sort of get hidden by the fact that, well, even in these two-dimensional distributions, right, they're, they're a result of integrating out two other dimensions. Uh, so, um, so reading these uh, plots to, uh, become quite uh, complicated. But this is anyway, uh, quite a standard way of, of presenting this. And even though these contours here, they look smooth, uh, they're effectively just smooth histograms. So the underlying stuff here is just a collection of samples collected by, uh, in this case, something like a nested sampling algorithm. Uh, and then, so these are just histograms and then smooth for the presentation. Um, right, uh, these, um, these colors, so if you look at uh, one of these 2D um, plots, you'll see, okay, there's a dark region and a light region. These dark and light regions then refer to, just as in propensity statistics, you typically use, okay, here's my 68% confidence region and my 95% confidence region. Uh, these regions here are 68% and 95% credible regions, which is the corresponding uh, 
analogous quantity in invasion statistics. And what it says is that that dark blue region, for instance, that dark blue region contains 68% of that two dimensional probability predisposition. And the light blue region contains 95%. Of, no. So, so the, the, the higher probability you, you contain, the wider your regions will necessarily get. Right? So it's saying, um, or unless I, I mix light and dark on my head, I'm not sure. But, but anyway, the, the, the wider regions, the, the light blue, for instance, here, the white region is saying, given my uh, prior assumptions and given my data, uh, within, I say that I have a 95% degree of belief that the true parameter point of these two parameters that I'm looking at, for instance, say uh, these two parameters, I say that within this light blue, I mean, okay, you should think that this light blue region also sort of includes the darker region. Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. So somewhere within here, I say that uh, with 90, I have 95% degree of belief that these two parameters live within that region. And I have only 68% degree of belief that they live within the smaller dark blue region. Yeah. Um, and of course, you can do the same thing in a one dimensional case, right? We, you could, along, say, this x axis here, you could have marked a region which was contained 68% of this blue PDF and a region that contained 95% of that blue PDF. Uh, one thing to note is that there's no unique way. I mean, if, if all I gave you was a probability distribution, let's say this one dimensional, uh, okay, let, let's say this blue distribution here. If all I gave, was, gave you was that probability distribution and I said, Give me a region that contains 68% of that probability distribution. You could go away and construct an infinite number of different regions, right? One way of doing it would be to say, okay, I'm just going to start on the left hand side and I'm going to move to the right until I collect the 68%. That would be a 68% credible region. It might not be the most useful one. In some cases, it is actually the most useful one. If what you're doing, if what you're trying to do is, for instance, set some upper limit or lower limit on something, then going in from one side might actually be the most useful thing. Uh, but what is more commonly done, uh, and it's, I think it's always the sort of choice that I've used unless I want to set an upper or lower limit, is to say, I'm going to make sure I'm going to choose the the interval that simultaneously also maximizes the posterior density within that region. So that's just a complicated way of saying, I'm going to start at the point of maximum probability density, and I'm just going to move down in probability density and outwards until my region contains 68% of the total probability. Right? And if then you have a multimodal distribution, where, where one, one mode was just slightly higher than the other, as soon as you sort of you move downwards, downwards, outwards, outwards, and suddenly you get to the height of that other mode, well, then your credible region should also start containing that other region. So then you can have a credible region, which is sort of two disjoint regions. That's perfectly fine. But this is a classic way of, uh, or a common way of, of defining a unique credible region. Just start from the point of maximum posterior probability and move downwards. Would you like expand that interval symmetrically, or would you also take into account the skewness of the of the distribution? Uh, no, you, you would typically just say I'm going to move one step down uh, in posterior height, right, and then sure, yeah. the shape of the distribution takes into account the, you know, the skewness you're, you're thinking of. Um, I will. Just because I have one last point uh, here, I want to um, do that before the end. So, okay, we can present much right for series, we can present, um, uh, say, 68 or 
my to pi or my to nine percent credible regions. Of course, you're free to choose other values, but then the reviewers then look at you and say, well, why are you choosing such, such change, strange numbers? Um, of course, we can also, as with any PDF, we can also try to summarize it using point estimates, right? So you can you could say, uh, I want to present uh, an expectation of you. Okay, so sure, you could use your samples to present the expectation value for theta, which of course then is okay. That's the parameter value times weighted by stereo integrated over all the parameter space, which is just your average theta um, on the set of data samples, right? And so that's perfectly fine. And, and if your probability distribution looks something like a, as a single peak, for instance, this makes a lot of sense. But keep in mind that the expectation value might be completely different, might be a completely unlikely value, right? So what if your, uh, I'll just use, this doesn't have to be posterior. This is just any probability density or any value x. But if your probability density is something like this, right? Then the expectation value for x will live somewhere here. So that's a completely unlikely value for x. So if you have a multimodal distribution like this, just giving the expectation value is probably a bit misleading. Um, so this, um, but if you know that, okay, I have a normal distribution, probability distribution, for instance, I'm giving just expectation value on the weight, of course, it's, it's perfectly fine. So, but keep in mind that when you give expectation values that it might be completely uh, improbable. So, the, I'll wrap this up next time uh, by talking about um, a final sort of effect that you get in invasion parameter estimation, which is uh, penalizing what's called fine tuning. So, um, invasion parameter estimation um, penalizes uh, highly fine tuned models. And we'll look at some. Uh, concrete examples from the literature um, on sort of effects that can have, and then we'll do method sampling and start on caution processes.